Good morning, everybody. This is uh, Lisa Stromquist from CAFC. I'm the coordinator for quality and patient safety programs here, and I'd like to welcome everybody to our um, our patient safety collaborative webinar this morning or this afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, just to let everybody know, all the lines coming in are on mute. And uh, if you have any questions or if you have any comments, you can type them into your um, into the question box, which is on uh, in your control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. We will be taking uh, answering the questions and uh, taking questions um, after the presentation today. Um, but certainly just write in your questions as you think of them. And if you have dialed in on the telephone, um, or if you have a working mic and speakers and you're, and you're um, uh, connected uh, through VoIP, um, you may raise your hand and hopefully I'll try to be able to, um, to unmute your line and we can uh, participate in a live discussion as well. So I'm, I'm going to welcome everybody uh, everybody to the call and pass you over to Darlene Bolivar, the co-chair of Cassie's Patient Safety Collaborative. Hello and welcome to everybody on the line today. Um, thank you, Lisa. And as Lisa said, my name is Darlene Bolivar and I am the co-chair of the uh, CAFC uh, Patient Safety Collaborative and I'm in Halifax at the IWK Health Center. And my co-chair um, is Tracy Rong from CHEO and I'm not sure whether she'll be able to join us today. So. She may be on the line and jump in. We also have Elaine Orbein from CAFC on the line with us, as well as our uh, speakers, which I'll introduce in just a moment to you. Um, but just before we get started, I'll just tell you a little bit, if, for those of you who may be new to the uh, Patient Safety Collaborative, uh, it's a volunteer group that meets uh, online, uh, sorry, online or on the telephone, uh, the fourth Friday of every month, and we've been doing so for a number of years now. And our goal is really be a collaborative, share information, and uh, frequently we have presentations on topical issues that are pertinent to the pediatric uh, focus of healthcare. So. Um, today will, is no different with our topic that we have. Um, so uh, briefly, our topic today is um, implementing the opioid safety guidelines, some of the successes cha and challenges at Health Sciences North. So we're using a specific case sample of uh, uh, how these guidelines were implemented and what challenges they came up against. So just a little bit about the opioid uh, guidelines is this was, uh, again, another collaborative between um, the Patient Safety, uh, Canadian Patient Safety Institute, Baxter Corporation, MedBuy, Hair Rocket in Ontario, uh, CAFC, and ISMP Canada. And they began working together on this in about 2008. And their goal was really to enhance the safety of pediatric medication use. So it's been done in a number of phases, and the first phase of the project was really to identify the top five medications that re were reported as causing harm or potential harm to pediatric healthcare patients. Um, they also identified existing leading practices, and, an and they analyzed the information obtained to develop the solutions uh, uh, to form the basis of the medication safety intervention that was chosen. So um, really, phase, so that was kind of phase one. So then phase two um, had a goal of creating an intervention that was going to assist with the implementation of the safe medication practices for opioids, because when they did the phase one, opioids came out obviously as one of the top drugs that were could be uh, potentially harmful in the pediatric setting. And it was to include all aspects of opioid medication systems from prescribing to storage and to administration. And so they looked at standard concentration for IV dosaging, uh, safe storage and labeling, and prescribing. And then phase three is really focused on education, knowledge exchange, and the implementation of the guidelines. 
So um, the highlights were that uh, revised CAFC ISMP Canada Pediatric Opioid Safety Consensus Guidelines. So we did get consensus. Um, and the launch of an electronic pediatric opioid safety resource kit, which you can find on the CAFC website in the Knowledge Exchange Network, or what we fondly recall, uh, call CAN. So there are consensus guidelines are there. The, re uh, the references and the recommended readings are there, and the resource, uh, resources and tools are also uh, loaded onto the CAN. So uh, across Canada, hospitals are in various stages of implementing the consensus guidelines. Some are just uh, starting uh, to move to the smart pump technology and the standard concentrations, and others are farther along. So today, that brings us to today, where, where, as I said before, we're going to hear about uh, the journey that Health Sciences North in Sudbury, Ontario, um, have been on as they're implementing all of the pediatric guidelines in their largely acute care adult facility that also has pediatrics. So that gives you a little bit of the, the work that's been being done over the last four or more years on opioid safety in pediatrics. So, Today, we have uh, two presenters from Sudbury with us, Tiffany Nero and Danielle DeFrate. Um, and Danielle graduated from the University of Montreal with her Bachelor of Science in Pharmacy um, about seven or so years ago, and beginning her career in, in a, an acute care general hospital, she developed an interest in pediatrics and in the family and child program. So she now has that relationship built and is uh, with the pediatric and the neonatal intensive care units and works closely with their team in order to develop the safe medication practices. And Tiffany uh, graduated from the University of Waterloo with her uh, Bachelor of Science in Pharmacy. She's been a pharmacist for a few years now, and uh, she was first exposed to pediatrics during her uh, schooling and her co-op placements, and her interest in pediatrics has then allowed her to become more actively involved in the projects for the Family and Child Program, and specifically in regards to safe medication practices. So that's a, a background on the opioid safety, um, the presenters we're going to have today, and I'm going to turn it over to uh, Danielle and Tiffany. Great. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for uh, attending today. So Danielle and I are going to be talking uh, about how Health Sciences North implemented the opioid safety guidelines, and um, we'll highlight some of our successes and challenges that we faced along the way. Um, so first, I wanted to give you some background on Health Sciences North. We're about a 475-bed, um, largely acute care hospital, largely adult acute care hospital, sorry. We have approximately 20 pediatric beds separated between um, our NICU and the pediatric department. So prior to 2010, we were three sites. Then in March 2010, we merged into one site. With this merge brought many changes, including more pharmacists and staff members having to familiarize themselves with uh, pediatric patients and their orders. So currently, we have about 21 pharmacists on staff. However, none of these pharmacists are specifically dedicated to the pediatric and NICU uh, department. So oh, I just wanted to let you forgive us. We just came back from the beautiful Cabo San Lucas um, and unfortunately came back to something similar to this. So forgive us if our brains are still on, on holidays. <laughs> Um, so the first thing we're going to talk, so I'll just go over what we're going to talk about today. Um, we'll go over why we thought change was needed, um, what changes we made, and how that changed our practice. And with all these changes come struggles, so we will discuss some of the barriers and where we go from here. Like most healthcare professionals, patient safety is at the forefront of our minds, and that was our main motivator um, for us to do our practice review. Uh, we did receive a big push in the right direction when our institution hired a patient safety pharmacist in 2011. Uh, Ravi DeVries held that position here at Health Sciences North. Um, some of you may be familiar with Ravi's work um, with ISMP. Um, he has a background both in patient safety and in pediatrics. Um, and these specialties served us really well when our institution made the decision to move towards compliance uh, with the pediatric opioid safety guidelines 
Ravi's knowledge was an incredibly useful tool. Um, I will definitely have to add that uh, we did have a few near misses at our institution, which caused us um, to want to review our current practices, analyze the situations in which these occurred, and make changes where needed. Um, we're going to further discuss these incidents, uh, these incidents on the next slide. Um, lastly, our motivation also lies in the desire to make our lives and our jobs easier. The more you standardize products, dosing sizes, and medication administration, the better um, your staff is familiarized with everything that's available, and that helps to reduce errors on all ends, from the prescribing to the dispensing to the administration. So as Danielle mentioned, we had some medication incidents that prompted us to change our practices. So all of the incidents involved, involved prompted a change that we will mention throughout our presentation. The first incident involved a morphine infusion. A morphine infusion was started overnight, and the night shift RN prepared a 20 microgram per mil concentration of morphine to run. The next morning, the pharmacy manufactured and dispensed a 40 microgram per mil concentration of morphine for that infusion. However, the RN ran the manufactured infusion as if it were the 20 microgram per mil concentration. So unfortunately, the patient did receive two times the dose that they should have. Um, this incident prompted the decision to start the ball rolling for a creation of NICU sedation orders. Um, the next incident was actually a good catch, so the patient never received any of, uh, of what I'm talking about. A physician ordered a morphine infusion as 20 micrograms per kilo per minute. Um, however, the correct unit should have been micrograms per kilo per hour. So it could have resulted in a 60-fold overdose. The, in, the, the error was caught before um, it reached the patient, but again, sedation preprinted orders would have prevented this. Um, another morphine incident occurred because we had two concentrations of morphine loaded into our Pixis machines. Um, while they were in separate pockets, both concentrations were available of morphine. Um, in this case, morphine was ordered as one milliliter. The MD had intended on a one milligram dose. However, the patient was administered five milligrams as both five milligrams per mil and one milligram per mil. One mil syringes were available. Um, in, in this case, this per prompted the organization to remove um, the 5 milligram per mil morphine concentration uh, hospital-wide. We also had a near miss with our PCA order forms. Um, in the past, we only had adult PCA order sets. Um, these forms contained references to pediatric dosing. However, they weren't used in the pediatric population, mainly due to the fact that a lot of the details did not pertain to our pediatric population. The adjuncts on the order were in, um, were all focused towards the adult population, and some of the drugs were not the best options for our pediatric patients. The monitoring parameters on these adult orders also did not always meet the recommendations for the pediatric population. Um, these issues were definitely brought to light when we created our smart pump drug library for our PCA pump. We noticed uh, we were having some difficulty programming the pumps for our pediatric patients and um, decided at that point that we should look towards creating pediatric specific PCA orders. Um, separate from our adult forms. Um, when we did this, we noticed that our adult order form reference line for pediatric dosing was incorrect. Uh, the hydromorph dose that was recommended on those orders was actually tenfold the recommended dose for this population. Um, as I mentioned, we never used these forms in the pediatric population for a lot of other issues, and we were very thankful that that was the case um, when we discovered this error. We have since rolled out new PCA order forms that are specific to our pediatric unit, and we'll show you those in a little bit. So we'll get started on some of the changes that we've made here at um, Health Sciences North. Um, all of these incidents or near misses highlighted the importance uh, of reviewing our practices and moving forward with these changes. We realized that one of the biggest hurdles when doing independent double checks of physician orders was determining the prescriber's intent. Um, sometimes it's 
becomes difficult to tell what they were actually trying to order for drugs that have large dosage ranges. This prompted the creation of a physician order sheet that allowed the physician to input the intent and the dose in milligrams per kilo per dose or milligrams per kilo per day, uh, depending on the drug that they were ordering. Um, we created two types of order forms, which are currently being trialed in the pediatric unit. Give us a second, we'll pull them up and give you a, a look. The first form that we um, have created is the pediatric physician admission order. And these are specific to pediatrics in that it, it um, highlights the weight, height, and allergies for the patients, which is very important. Um, all pediatric orders should not proceed unless um, you know this information about the patient. It makes it clear what the diagnosis is and who the MRP for this um, patient is. The admission orders gives uh, the physician a chance to address the diet activity, vitals, IV fluids for the patient, as well as any other general orders. If we scroll down to the medication order section, you'll see that the, the physician is prompted to put the name of the medication as well as the dose, and then also to describe what the weight-based dose intent was. So if they were ordering 0.1 milligram per kilo per dose, they would be asked to write that information in and then specify the root frequency and any other comments that they might have, um, such as if it's a PRN for cough or PRN for pain or for fever. Um, by separating all of these uh, requirements, you prompt the physician to remember to include all of this information on his order, and it makes it really easy for either the nurse or the pharmacy to come along and do an independent double check, knowing exactly what the prescriber intended. The other orders physician orders that we put um, are the medication only or for any um, orders that continue on in the patient's chart after their admission. These ones allow a space for the physician to, to freehand any lab work needed, but also include that same medication um, section at the bottom. You'll notice that all of our orders um, include the do not use abbreviation symbols or designation um, at the top, which allows the physician a quick glance of stuff that they should not be writing on their order. Uh, all of our charts have a do not use abbreviation sheet that's provided in every patient chart for the physician to refer to at the front of the chart, and it also tells them what they should be using instead of these do not use abbreviations. Our next step, as Tiffany had mentioned, is working towards our NICU sedation orders, um, which will minimize prescriber errors, ensure proper monitoring, and identify available solutions to avoid administration errors. Um, dosing ranges on these orders will also facilitate a double check from all ends, from the prescriber to the dispenser to nursing to the nurses who are doing the administration. Um, we are currently in the process of reviewing all of our NICU monographs for all medications and including our opioids, which our, our main goal with that is to make sure that the information that we are providing to our nurses is the most up-to-date and also that all of our orders match the recommendations on our monographs. Okay, so some to continue with the changes, um, as Daniela mentioned, um, the PCA orders were created in uh, November 2011, and they were created due to issues with the use of our adult PCA orders in the pediatric uh, demographic. The organization felt that pediatric orders should be made for proper monitoring and management of these patients, so the, I'll show you the, our copy of the PCA orders. Just bear with me here. <clears throat> so this is what our pediatric uh, PCA orders look like. So as you can see, again, we have the weight, height, and allergies at the very top. Um, and it specifies the um, physician that's most responsible for ordering the 
analgesia. So um, in some cases, we'll have the pediatrician order it, but in other cases, it might be our acute pain service doctor ordering it. So it just lets the nurse know who they should be contacting in case of, of, of any issues. Um, so as you can see, these are pediatric specific. So if I just scroll down here, and you can see that each, there's respiratory rate specific, all of the monitoring processes are for based on their weight or the age of the child. Um, and if you notice, if I keep going down, all of the adjuncts are written in a milligram per kilo um, way of writing it. Um, and they're all done in um, the same unit. So I'll show you the second page. So you can see like naloxone was 0 0.002 milligrams per kilo per dose. And if I go to the next each. You can see that each, um, everything is written in the same units in order to prevent errors. Also, all of our adjuncts are also done that in the same way. So this is the third page. It's just more of the adjuncts. And yeah, that was it. So continue here. I'm just going to, we also have another website that we'll show you. So our institution is lucky that this staff has access to CHEO resources. And the first is the CHEO outreach site. So hopefully I'm still logged in, which I am. So um, if this site, I don't know if everybody's familiar with it, but it provides um, drug monographs for both pediatrics and NICU. So all of our nursing staff in pediatrics has access to this, and as well as all of the pharmacists. Um, so Oh, I don't want to go there. If you click on the, this is for specifically NICU, but if you can click on one of the monographs, it provides um, all of the information that you would need to process an order, for instance. Got more. So it just gives you all the information, what their um, what their doses that CHEO uses are, um, how to you know do dose checks, um, and different things that. And we based our PCA orders on on these in the pediatric from the pediatric one as well as the NICU sedation orders. We'll be basing on this as well. So that's just an example. Our nurses also have access to um, the standard drug concentrations. Oh, and if you notice, like the IV drug co continuous infusions, well, they have specific um, how to mix them. So unfortunately, our, we don't have a pharmacist here 24 hours a day. So um, this allows the nursing staff to be able to figure out how to make a morphine 2 milligram per mil solution alone. They can always call us. We are, we're on call 24-7, so somebody would be able to call us if they had any questions. But it provides information on how to actually make it. Um, also, we have all of our nurses have access to the um, standard concentrations for pediatric drug infusions website. I believe everybody has access to this through um, through the Ken network, but um, like we can just go through it a step. So, like for instance, for the morphine, if you just keep continue, our pharmacists have access to this too. It allows you to pick the, con the morphine concentration that you have. And this is standardized to CHEO's um, concentration. So we'll pick the right one, 0 0.1 milligrams per mil. And then it, as you can see, it helps you calculate um, based on the dose based on the dose ordered in micrograms per kilo per hour. It's good to double check as well to make sure your units are correct. And then the IV infusion rate and um, the percent deviation. So I'll go back here. So another step our institution took was to restrict which opioids were stock on pediatric units. Um, we only stock hydromorphone and morphine. All other opioids are provided on an as-needed basis and sent in patient name from pharmacy. Um, yesterday, conveniently, the Wall Street Journal announced that the um, FDA warned against the use of codeine in children. Well, good news for us, HSN was ahead of the game. Um, in 2011, we removed codeine from 
uh, for pediatrics and created an automatic substitution policy. So sorry, I'm like probably keep going in and out. So I'll just show you our, our uh, automatic substitution. So it goes through the reasons why we decided to, to remove the use of um, codeine. So it goes through and gives all the safety concerns um, and the possible toxicity. Um, so it gives the rationale behind why we created this up. And so we've made the form, this is actually an auto substitution now. So um, it bases, it switches all of our codeine to um, morphine. So this was a big issue when we had pa patients that went in for surgeries and were prescribed say, Tylenol 3 uh, post-op. And then um, they would get codeine regardless. So now we would substitute the Tylenol 3 to its proper uh, in equivalent of morphine and um, the 325 milligrams of Tylenol. Now, as much as we've had much success with the changes that we've made here at HSN, we also face many challenges. Um, time would be, in my opinion, one of the biggest hurdles that we've had, um, time and resources. As much as both Tiffany and I love the pediatric world, we're not full-time in this role. And most of the work that we do is spread out here and there as time permits. This means that it may take us a little bit longer to create and to implement the changes that we would like. Um, we do have great support from our pediatric department. Um, nurse clinician, management, and pediatricians uh, make themselves readily available to help us out when, when needed. Um, and we rely definitely on their expertise to help facilitate uh, the creation and the implementation of all of these changes. Um, we also no longer have a patient safety pharmacist. Uh, Ravi has moved on from our organization for, uh, I'd say, greener, but I'm not sure if it's greener, but definitely warmer pastures. Um, so that creates, that creates um, another barrier in terms of the resources that we have. Um, when you have somebody in a dedicated role who is looking at all of your practices and helping to implement stuff, um, things can definitely proceed at a much quicker rate. Uh, we also have had some issues or are currently having some issues with technology and um, drug availability. Um, our pediatric department uses mainly the Plum A pumps, and we created a drug library with the MedNet system for them when we, when we created one for the rest of the organization in 2009. At the time, um, our NICU uses mainly syringe pumps, and at that time we did not have the technology for a drug library on those syringe pumps. We have recently come across um, this software to implement the drug library for our neonatal ICU syringe pumps, and that brings to light all of the concentrations that need to be standardized um, for all of our infusions, including our opioids. And uh, we're currently struggling with how to best um, program these pumps to serve this population. So that's an ongoing, um, ongoing work that's happening right now. Um, we also are having um, some issues with the use of our um, admit, with our, the use of our physician order forms. I will say our admission order forms are being used quite regularly. I think because they're very easy to use and they facilitate the admission process. There's a lot of check boxes and things that the physician, uh, that prompt the physician to, um, to just order um, by checking a box. Now the general order forms are not being used as readily. I think there are, um, we're being told that the physicians find that there are some space constraints. They're having some issues writing within the, the permitted space and they don't always like being told that they have to put um, the um, indication or the uh, intent um, of ordering. So we're working on, with them to make them a little bit bigger and hopefully make them a little bit more user-friendly from their end. So that's ongoing. And once we get to a form that is liked by all of our physicians, the hope is to spread those pediatric forms out throughout the organization for pediatric patients on any unit, including the emergency department and our ICU. Now, staff education is 
definitely required whenever you're doing any changes. Um, the pediatric nursing staff is used to dealing with all pediatric patients. And, but as we mentioned, these patients do move throughout the hospital into adult units, such as the eMERGE or ICU. Um, in those units, it can be a little more difficult to educate the staff towards um, the particularities of pediatric patients. It can be a bit cumbersome to, to do staff education for those, for those nurses in those areas because the, the staff does not see pediatric patients as readily. Um, pharmacy struggles as well because we haven't yet completed our standardization process. And some of our staff um, have a bit of anxiety when dealing with pediatric patients. Uh, we also have some issues with some of the other physicians who may be consulted for pediatric patients, but who don't often work with, with um, the pediatric population. They're not always aware of the practicalities or particularities of um, medication prescribing in the pediatric population. We have some physicians who view um, peds as little adults, which we all know is not the case. So ultimately, we hope that the changes we have made will limit the number of errors and increase patient safety um, related to opioids, not only in pediatrics, but across the organization. Um, furthermore, we selfishly hope that the changes discussed will help facilitate dispensing as it minimizes inventory and product availability. Um, hopefully, in the, long run, in the long run, we will have made staff more knowledgeable and aware of opioid safety and have made their jobs easier by having tools and policies in place so that they can refer if an issue arises. Um, but as I mentioned, um, with changes come challenges. When we decided to make these changes, we faced some barriers along the way. Our biggest hurdle is that since we are largely in an adult center, it is impossible to segregate pediatric patients to one area, like Danielle mentioned. There are times when a pediatric patient is forced to go to the ICU, and almost all of our pediatrics have to go through the emergency department. Um, while our pediatric nurses are used to dealing with peds, the nurses in the ICU and the ER, for instance, aren't. We are continuing to try and educate and help whenever possible in these areas. Um, we are also not unique in that resources and time are a large factor. Um, since we only have approximately 20 pediatric beds, it is not busy enough for a full-time pharmacist at this time. And as Danielle and I mentioned, um, we do have excellent nurse clin clinicians that are always help and pediatricians that always help when needed. And as for our next step, um, we are still building our syringe pump drug library for NICU and our NICU sedation preprinted orders and policy are in the works. Um, both of these are going to have to force us to standardize our concentration for opioids and other drugs as well. Um, and finally, of course, we'll continue to educate um, our pharmacy staff, the nursing staff, and the physicians. And finally, in summary, we wanted to give you just an overview of the Ken guidelines and where we were sort of in within these. So um, right now, uh, adopt standard concentrations. We do have standard concentrations that are unique to our hospital, but um, we're working towards compliance in that we're trying to adopt standardized concentrations that will facilitate transfers to other sites. So, you know, maybe choosing um, the same standard, standard concentrations as CHEO. Um, the next one is to adopt standard methods for preparing and administering bolus doses of opioids. So that will come with our syringe pump libraries and um, th things like that. And we'll, as soon as we develop standard concentrations, it will help with the, um, use, by using this, the CHEO website for the nurses. Um, include dosage by weight for all opioid orders. So we're trying to do that. Um, but as Danielle mentioned, there is some um, issues with some of the orders with space constraints and stuff like that. But they are using it um, for the admission orders, which are forcing them to order in milligrams per kilo. So we are working towards compliance, but we probably would be more towards the compliant area on that one. Um, so label every dose of opioid intended for oral or parental admission. Uh, administration. We are completely complying with that. Um, develop and dis disseminate um, institution-wide dosing and monitoring guidelines for opioids in pediatric patients. Um, so currently, like we said, we struggle with the um, adult areas such as the ICU and the ER. Um, 
we are working towards compliance with, you know, figuring out we've moved into that with the PCA orders, but hopefully we'll be able to put in our pediatric um, order forms in all of those areas as well. Um, so segregate pediatric formulations from adult populations. The next four we're completely compliant with as well. Um, so that's pretty much it. We'll open the floor to any questions that you may have. Hopefully you enjoyed our presentation. Thanks very much, um, uh, Tiffany and Danielle. Um, I have a question from uh, Jana Lowry. It says, I'm wondering if I can get a copy of the PCA, PPO, and the admission order form. And she's provided her email. Sure. <laughs> if, you send us, if you can send that to us, we'll, we can make sure that we send that off. Sure. And actually, Carolyn has the, uh, the same uh, request about your pre-printed orders. So. Oh, oh, sure. Super. So Elaine or Darlene, did you have any comments to make? Hi, it's Darlene. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Danielle and Tiffany. That was a great overview. I think sometimes, uh, I guess a comment, I think sometimes those of us who, you know, have a large volume of pediatrics or maybe pediatrics is our, our main business or focus, uh, forget about the challenges that uh, a smaller um, pediatric subset of a larger population present. So I guess I'm wondering, and, and maybe I have the context wrong, but when you mention eMERGE and you mention um, uh, ICU, I assume that that's a mixed population. And I guess I'm wondering what safeguards you're looking at putting in place to make sure, even though you have maybe have the standard concentrations developed and the standardized order sheets, what what is the decision point for whether you would when a patient is considered an adult versus a pediatrics, is it by age, is it by weight, and then what safeguards would you put in place to ensure that the right order sets are being used based on that decision point? Uh, generally speaking, in our institution, under 18 years of age is considered um, a pediatric patient. Um, our pediatricians will continue to follow um, any pediatric patient who ends up in the ICU. Um, they work with the intensivist as needed uh, to make sure that that patient is being looked at from a pediatric standpoint as well. Um, now, I will say that it is the exception to the rule. Um, our, I wouldn't even consider our ICU to be a mixed population. We would maybe have maybe one pediatric patient every few months who would end up um, being transported into the ICU. And that's generally, um, for the most part, um, if the patient requires more frequent monitoring um, or is on any kind of presser or ventilation of any kind that did not warrant a transfer out. Um, we would refer most of our really severe um, ICU patients would either end up at CHEO or at sick kids. Um, now, in terms of, of, of that, it makes it, that's one of our biggest challenges. It makes it very difficult um, to identify these patients readily and make sure that they are using the proper order sets um, right off the get-go. Uh, I will say our pediatricians are our biggest allies in that, in that stance. Um, they usually are the ones who get in there right away and make sure that uh, the orders are appropriate for peds. Um, our pharmacists who work within the ICU generally work with the nursing staff um, to make sure that they're aware of all the CHEO resources that are out there. Uh, we'll generally print them off uh, an infusion chart for all of the medications that they would be running in the ICU to make sure that they're aware. Uh, and then we always work with those, with those nurses um, to make sure that they know how to access that information. As Tiffany had mentioned before, we do have a 24-hour um, on-call service for our pharmacists. So often when a pediatric patient gets transferred into the ICU, um, they will give us a call and make sure that everything is um, up to standards for that patient. Uh, it always does depend on the patient's age and weight. Um, I will say that they tend to, the, our ICU nurses, 
are quite comfortable dealing with um, teenagers who would be of adult, uh, of adult uh, weight, but with our younger patients, they definitely <laughs> give us a call for our input. And most, and most of the time, all of our pediatric doses are sent in patient name to those areas because unfortunately, they don't stock those types of things in, in Pixis down in, in these areas. So most of the time, that's how we safeguard the medication dispensing part, part of it. Like, it's all sent from pharmacy. Um, additionally, we do have a pediatric ICU um, library within our Plum A infusion pumps. So the nurses are um, should be accessing the pediatric specific ICU component as opposed to being in the adult ICU. So all of the um, limits, safe limits for infusion for our pediatric population are inputted into that um, drug library on those infusion pumps. It also prompts them to use the correct concentrations for that population. I have a couple of uh, other questions and comments here. Thanks. Um, so uh, Aaron was able to give me his questions. Um, so regarding reception by the staff, has there been a difference between newer staff or older staff readoption? Uh, their NICU underwent standardization order sheets for general admissions, and we found the higher barrier to acceptance by those with greater seniority. So I don't. Um, do you have any comments around that? Um, I would say that I think most of the changes we made um, facilitate our lives as opposed to make a hindrance to them. So uh, we've been quite lucky with getting a lot of acceptance from all parts. I haven't personally noticed a difference between our older staff versus our newer staff. Um, if anything, our newer staff is probably a little more apt to um, knowing how to use the Internet and being able to use all the electronic resources and uh, maneuvering in those in those um, in that way and I think our pediatricians helped us out a lot too because they really advocated for the admission orders and the physician order sheets that were developed and they also kind of press um, other physicians to comply with the standards that they provide so I think if if they get a a champion. A champion and kind of hope for the best there. So uh, there's a, just another comment from Blair in uh, Saskatoon. Uh, it says, copy of your removal of coding. We are in the, uh, they're looking for copies of your removal of coding information. And he says, we're in the same process at Saskatoon Health Region, but it's very tough in the non-pediatric emergency departments, uh, which mm -hmm. they have six of them in the region. So. Uh, He's looking maybe for some of your information on that. I will say we did have a lot of pushback from some of our non-pediatric physicians um, when we did the coding removal. Um, but we, as Tiffany mentioned, we, I think we rolled those out in 2011. Yeah. And we have won them all over to our side. <laughs> <laughs> so it is, it is doable. It is a bit of a push, but it is doable. Again, a champion is needed. And I will say that we got the nurses on board for, for that, and we presented all of the um, safety information to our nurses, um, both in PEDS and in, in the eMERGE, um, when we went forward with that automatic substitution. And it was really the nurses, I think, who pushed the physicians into total compliance um, with those orders because they just flat out told them it wasn't happening. So it was great. And I think, too, using the media as, as your tool is, is great. So, like I mentioned, the Wall Street Journal just came out with an article that said it, it's very readily available in the media. So if you push it on your physicians with, with that thing, you know, everyone is, is doing this. Everyone is getting away from coding. Um, and using your community pharmacist as, as um, like, another resource and, you know, trying to have them explain to uh, physicians ordering it in the community that codeine isn't exactly the best option. I, I didn't we have one where the parents were nervous about yeah. codeine? Yeah. So we've also had some struggles with that where the parents were perceived codeine as a much safer option as opposed to morphine. So we've had those challenges as well. Great. So I have a few more questions and comments. 
so uh, my name is Janine, and I'm a CNE from BC at Surrey's new Pediatric Emergency Department that will be opening this October. I would be interested in the pre-printed orders and sheets that were shown in the presentation. And um, I'm also curious as to the actual pumps uh, that uh, are in use out in your neck of the woods. So I don't know if you want to talk about which pumps you use or if that um, you can just send her that information when... Yeah, well, we can definitely send her that information if you send yeah. us all of, all of um, the contact information. Uh, currently, we use um, our main infusion pumps are the Plum A Hospira pump, um, which utilize the MedNet drug library. Um, and then for our PCAs, we use the Hospira L PCA um, pump. And those are really nice pumps because uh, they allow you to barcode the medication that is going in there. In fact, not only do they allow you to, they insist upon it, you cannot run a medication unless it has a barcode. So by having the, the barcode option, you make sure that not only can they not um, pick the wrong drug and then put the right drug in and pick the wrong drug to infuse or vice versa, the, as soon as the medication is entered into the pump, it is barcoded and the correct information appears on your screen. Um, so those are quite useful. Um, we have uh, for the syringe pumps, uh, for our NICU, we use, Med, we use the MedFusion pumps. Um, and their software is FarmGuard. Um, it's, and it's, it's comparable. We haven't done a lot with, with it yet. We're still trying to play around with um, how to set the limits and, and that sort of thing. But it, yeah, it's pretty as well. And I have a very positive comment from uh, Elaine Wong at CHEO. She says, congratulations. Every step you have taken will make a difference. It's great to know that the CHEO material we have shared is being used. So, And we're very grateful to CHEO for sharing all that information. Uh, as are we. As are we. Yeah. I will say, as much as people want our PCA orders, we went and got CHEO. <laughs> so we, could, we will take some credit for putting our name on them, but uh, we did get a lot of the information from both CHEO and SickKid, so that's great. And I will say, being a, a center that refers a lot of our patients to either CHEO or SickKid, it would be incredibly useful if as a, a province, and I don't know if we want to go as far as saying nationally, if you, everyone got on board and we were all doing the same thing, then when you had a patient who went from one institution to the other, it would facilitate that transfer and provide an added safety uh, measure on that end as well. And I think that's one of the main benefits of the, the Ken Network, as well as being a, a great resource. It kind of uh, encourages everyone to get on the same page. Exactly. Thank you. Elaine, I, I just want to uh, make a comment at this point and really to echo what Elaine Wong has just said at CHEO. I, I, I too want to congratulate Health Sciences North and Danielle and, and uh, Tiffany. This work is outstanding. I, I want to point out just a couple of statistics and, and, and facts just to emphasize the importance of what we're doing together and your leadership, uh, Sudbury's leadership here, you know, we've you started off talking about, you know, part of the challenge is are, are in fact your low volumes of pediatrics. You have a 20 bed unit. It's once every couple of months that that child or, or youth is admitted to the ICU, et cetera. You know, that the very important information you shared. You know, in, in spite of low volumes, and I'm sure there are many of our colleagues across the country this morning joining us who are in very, very similar situations. And yet, I'm going to quote something that you've probably all heard me say, 60%, more than 60% of all inpatient services provided to children and youth are provided in community hospitals. So the, the sharing of best practices, the sharing of these standards, and I'm going to say the uptake of these, of these standards is so critical. So to your point you know, about, about the importance of us all using this, this absolutely is going to decrease adverse events and near misses and all of those things, but it's really going to create a much safer system. Uh, across the country, because in spite again of those low volumes, 
um, the majority of our children are being cared for and cared for very well within our community hospitals. So we've got to keep remembering that in our, in our education and our knowledge translation when we're convincing perhaps that, that colleague who's still a little resistant to change. Um, those, those, those reminders have to come into play. But I, I too, want to congratulate uh, Tiffany and, and Danielle. I want to congratulate you and all of our Sudbury colleagues and also recognize CHEO's leadership in this field. Thank you. I have a couple more comments here. So, uh, again, from Aaron. So, as an individual with horrible handwriting, has the order sheets improved legibility of physicians' handwritten orders? Uh, do they write the orders more legibly when using the order sheets? Um, sometimes, yes, because <laughs> as we mentioned, they, one of their biggest complaints is is space constraints. So sometimes they have to print um, and write it a little more condensed in order to get the information they want on the form. But I would say that that's a battle that I'm not sure we'll ever win. <laughs> Maybe with CPOE. Maybe with CPOE. <laughs> yes. When we get to CPOE, we'll finally win the handwriting battle. But um, we have, I will say that we have been lucky that uh, we have a lot of interns going through our um, pediatric department. So it's a little easier to encourage the interns to use those forms and to write a little more legibly. And I find if you call them every time they write a bad order, then sooner or later they'll try to write it nicer the next time. <laughs> <laughs> and I have a question from uh, Paul Filiatro uh, out in BC. Have you measured success of your implementation of weight-based weight dosing in non-pediatric areas? No. Not as, no, not as of yet. Well, they the orders haven't been um, set like put institution wide yet. They're still in a pilot in the pediatric department, so we haven't had a chance to um, measure the statistics. But we definitely. So actually, Paul. Yeah, Paul. I'm going to try to unmute you because I have a question for you. So hopefully you can. On. Paul, are you there? Uh, can you hear me? I'm actually on my. I can hear you. Okay, I'm, I'm speaking through the voice over internet. Excellent, it's working well. Um, so, Paul, I know that um, you were working out there in Interior Health to um, to implement uh, standard concentrations of morphine, and I'm just wondering um, what your experience has been, if you want to share that. We had, um, like was explained here, we did have an incident that prompted us to um, look at some safety enhancements and so we have instituted a, a standard concentration of morphine uh, per the CAPC guidelines uh, and ICP guidance that came out and have implemented that at, uh, at one of our tertiary sites where they periodically do pediatric surgeries and <clears throat> it has been working uh, well, although the uh, uh, you know there's the frequency of those surgeries certainly are not uh, really high. I think they they basically put less than a hundred kids uh, uh, through a, an anesthetic procedure, but but definitely the uh, morphine we have a pediatric preprinted order for um, a, you know with the concentrated morphine. Uh, standard orders on it, and uh, happy to uh, send that along if anybody. I was just going to ask if you could send that to us. <laughs> we actually have two of them: one uh, one for the little guys and one for the older guys. Anyways, I I can forward those uh, to to some to Lisa. Sure. And just uh, yesterday, we have. Um, uh, it's interesting to hear everybody and how everybody's almost you know uh, in a little bit of a foot race to implement. Uh, you know, weight-based dosing through syringe pumps. And just yesterday, we went live with uh, uh, a drug-enabled uh, Medfusion syringe pump at a 200-bed uh, facility with, uh, obviously, a, a small pediatric area. And that was uh, that's our test site. And, and so there's so the pediatric uh, syringe pumps were uh, put into the pediatric department, obviously, but also our emergency department made a strong case for the fact that 
they are almost um, terrified to get pediatric patients because of the lack of experience and resources. And so <clears throat> we're putting pediatric uh, syringe pumps in not only the uh, emergency department, but also the critical care area. And, and so the education implementation uh, has been done over the last few days. And so we're going to live in one place and we expect to have this rolled out through the organization by the end of the year and Garth Vatten, who I think made a present to ISMP actually is leading that for us. That's outstanding. That's outstanding. Yeah. Fabulous. Thanks very much Paul. And good luck. Thank you. And would we would you um would we be able to share some of your um resources on the uh, on the knowledge exchange network we have we are uh, I'm fully supportive of not reinventing the wheel so we're happy to share excellent thanks very much Lisa I'm just wondering quick quick point on that with all of the wonderful requests for exchange and and sharing um, I'm sure we can put all of all of these documents for even easier access right on the can I just I just wanted to mention that Perfect. Yeah. great yeah Thanks, Elaine. I was going to mention the same thing. Um, mm -hmm. that's, that's being really ca uh, cautious of the time. Uh, Lisa, do you have any other questions that are out there? No, I've just a lot of uh, thank yous and a lot of requests to share information. So. Excellent. Yeah. So uh, we can certainly arrange that. Again, Danielle and Tiffany, uh, what a great presentation on how you, uh, one site, were able to implement or are in the process of implementing the full um, CASI opioid safety guidelines. So that was just outstanding. Thank you again on behalf of uh, uh, all of us at CASI. And just to wrap up, I'll remind folks that are on the line that the next uh, Patient Safety Collaborative call will be uh, March 22nd. Uh, but CAFSI also uh, puts out a newsletter, an electronic newsletter, and that provides information on all of the CAFSI's webinar presentations and where you can find any of the past archived presentations. So if you've missed one and you want to see what's there, I would encourage you to check out Ken or um, have a look at the CAFSI uh, newsletter when it comes out to you. And if you don't, if you're not signed up for it yet, um, certainly get on the mail distribution list. Uh, thank you all for being online and um, thank you again to Tiffany and Danielle. And I'll turn it back to Elaine or Lisa for any final comments. I just want to just, thank everybody and then I'll just let Elaine talk. No. <laughs> It's really just saying the very, very same thing. It's been an excellent presentation, and I'm going to say collectively, I hope everyone just just feels rewarded in, in many ways at the work that we have all done together. It, it's, uh, it's tremendous. It really is, and we just we need to keep up the collaborative spirit, and I know we will. So thank you to all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. We'll talk to you next month. <laughs>